Right, so I'll get started. Um, if you haven't managed to have a little go at the quiz, don't worry, you can always go back to it. Um, it's a beautiful little Royal Academy of Engineering resource and you put your name in. I think it's really lovely for students. You pop your name in and then it asks you some really pupil friendly <laughs> questions in like a diverse group of subjects, all pupil friendly language. And then it maps out for you as like a spider web um, where your engineering habits of mind strengths lie, which I'll talk about a little bit more later. Um, but I think it's a really nice resource. So welcome everyone, Sabi's here. Uh, hello everyone. <laughs> Um, I'm Laura Watford, um, and this is Sabi Benzis. Um, my background is that I'm a Director of Science and Professional Mentor at Castleview Academy in Portsmouth, um, and I'm also a um, Teacher Coordinator for the Royal Academy of Engineering Connecting STEM Teachers Programme. So I have a STEM network where I support teachers with resources um, and encourage them uh, to embed curric STEM curriculum in the in the STEM in and STEM and STEAM in their curriculum and support them in doing so. Um, and I'm also an SLE for the city, so I support and advise schools um, on curriculum design and coaching teachers. Um, so Sabi, or oh, is he gone? Sabi is, is deputy head in a school in Hertfordshire and he is another STEM STEAM genius. Um, I am, my background is science and his is definitely computing and technology um, and he's done some incredible STEM stuff and he's going to tell his story um, shortly. Um, so I thought I'd start off, you can't really avoid talking about the reason we do all of these things without addressing the elephant in the room which is that the reason why we do this is that there's a huge stem skill shortage and there's also a changing job market and i think you know adopting a stem steam approach across your school um i think it's really really important to firstly address why we're doing it what's the motivation behind this and in 2007 lord sainsbury produced a report basically saying um We've got a massive shortage of STEM professionals, uh, scientists, engineers, people working in technology, and actually that's hugely damaging towards our economy. And then he said, as a result, we need to really address this issue and, and where it starts is in schools and through education. And sadly, since 2007, I would say that the, the situation there's been work towards it but it hasn't vastly improved in the UK we've still got a huge skills gap 48% um, report gaps in skills for their apprentice apprentices and young trainees leaving schools 73% of them have problems with their candidates not having the academic knowledge or their acquired skills 57 report technological technol uh, technical skills at a professional level so you know this is this is the issue that we're trying to address and this is what we're trying to do um, the World Economic Forum is a great place, again, if you're ever trying to justify, you know, why we're doing this and looking for some data as to, you know, why this needs to be done. Um, and basically, this is just one set of data and then many reports highlighting the shifting change with um, technology and artificial intelligence, meaning that actually the workforce needs to have really different skills. Um, and there's actually another report which demonstrates that basically the skills that students will require for the 2030 workforce, you know, are skills that we're, we're probably not addressing to the extent we should do in the current curriculum. And I think we can probably all see that perhaps more work needs to be done at a national level in the UK curriculum. Um, but actually, until that's done, I think it's our responsibility to start action now. Um, so I think like anything, when you're addressing a problem, it's really important to look at the academic research out there and look at what, what the professionals are saying when they've conducted their research. And actually, there's a brilliant paper, and I've referenced it at the end if you want to go and have a look at it. Um, it was published in January 2020, and um, it's a, a, a culmination of work that's been going on for many, many years around science capital. And when we talk about science capital, I think you could easily insert the word STEM capital. So not just for science, it's technology capital, it's engineering capital, it's mathematics capital. And I'm just going to show you a short clip because this basically summarises many, many years of research and basically highlights in a really nice model what we need to do to improve um, students, the number of students taking on STEM subjects into, into degree and into their professional lives. Research shows that most students find science interesting, but we're still facing a STEM skills gap. 
and the students taking STEM subjects after 16 still fall into roughly the same gender, ethnic and social groups as they did 20 years ago. That's why BP, King's College London and the Science Museum are collaborating to develop, measure and test a new concept that gets to the heart of how people engage with science. It's called science capital. A person's science capital is like a holdall or bag that they carry around with them, into which they put all their science-related knowledge, attitudes, skills and experiences. The science capital each person has splits into four main types. What you know, how you think, what you do and who you know. Everyone has different amounts of science capital and this affects whether they feel, yes, science is for me or not. Our research shows that the more science capital a child has, the more likely they are to follow STEM subjects. Science capital comes from a variety of sources, including school, home and family, out of school science learning and the things people experience in their everyday lives. It helps us see all the influences that lead to students choosing STEM subjects or not and understand why different groups aren't taking them further. We can also use science capital as a tool to develop more effective ways of supporting young people to engage with science. And by building the science capital of all children, more students from more diverse backgrounds will engage with science throughout their lives. Together, we can use the concept of science capital not only to bridge the STEM skills gap, but also to improve the life chances of all our children. Um, and I'm sure on some level that resonates with everyone. Um, I was talking to this, I was talking about this to um, a colleague who's going to support me with a bit of a STEM project I've got going on. And her background isn't in, in science or any STEM, STEM subject for that, for that matter. And she said to me, oh my goodness, yes, Laura, I really enjoyed science and technology at school, like was really good at them. She said, but actually in my home, no one has any STEM background. We didn't do any extra things. I didn't go to any extra curriculum the clubs we didn't visit like science museum natural history museum or go to you know stargazing events or anything and actually you know that did deter me from going down that route it wasn't that I wasn't able in those subjects I just I didn't have that extra um, things that added that were added on to encourage me down that route and I think that's what we're going to be talking about today so I'll be going to be talking about his experience and I'm going to be talking about my experience of how you can provide these really important opportunities to improve and increase that STEM capital for students so that, you know, if they're, if they're good, at, good in those subjects, if they're interested in those subjects, they certainly shouldn't be shying away from careers in them. Um, and so that's, that's our motivation behind this. So another piece of research, and I'm going to say, unlike many areas, actually, these are the two main things that you need to look at. If you're going to spend a lot of time reading the academic research into this area, I think once you've read a bit about science capital and once you've read a bit about engineering habits of mind, I think you'd be fully equipped to even design your own STEAM curriculum that, that has all the key aspects and really nicely and concisely designed. Um, the Royal Academy of Engineering spent, I've spent years um, carrying out a piece of work called Engineering Habits of Mind and basically looking at how we can have an underpinning structure underneath the curriculum where we use STEM subjects as an opportunity to develop what we've traditionally called these soft skills but they're skills that are essential to the workplace, they're skills that are essential to, to STEM industry but they're also essential to life. I mean if you think like curiosity, open-mindedness, resourcefulness, I mean, these are all skills that we'd want any student to have, but actually we can recognise that STEM subjects are a really good platform that even if they're not going to go in to, uh, to do STEM, they are a really good platform to develop those skills. Um, from the research findings, there's been many schools that have adopted this approach and they found that children who use engineering habits of mind have all of these really, really high level and really, really brilliant skills and attributes after undertaking projects that are based around engineering habits of mind. So I'm going to pass on to Sarvi and say so this session, the way the way we designed it, we're going to um, do a bit of storytelling. We're going to inspired by Anne's web, previous webinar on storytelling and how effective it can be to for people to learn. So, so we're going to start off with Sarvi's journey of Vex Robotics. So I'm going to hand over to Sarvi Benzit. Sorry about that earlier. Um, uh, literally, SLT meeting just finished, 
and uh, really poor internet connection. So I'm going to start off with, um, um, like, like Laura said, a journey that I went through and accidentally fell in, into something that was really inspiring for our students. And it's something called uh, VEX Robotics. Initially, it was a, a STEM after school club that um, we heard about. We, we actually got started with something called Lego Robotics, which I'll mention a little bit more in the next slide. And Lego Robotics is kind of a soft kind of type of robotics where obviously they're using Lego to create some sort of robot based around a brick, uh, a Lego, you know, it's called, it's called the Lego brick, but it's literally a brain where they program and they set up like, you know, the old school um, uh, logo um, devices where you program it to go four steps forward, five steps uh, to the right, etc. Very similar to that. So, but those students that started that Lego um, program with me, the Lego robotics program, wanted to go a, a step further. And then we found out about something called uh, VEX Robotics. And VEX Robotics is a, a growing robotics competition that runs in the UK. There is curriculum content, but there's also a, a competition element to it. And my students, as you can see here, is a couple of a couple of key students here. I started this group up with, um, you know, a, a group of uh, a group of boys who are very interested in doing some robotics, but obviously you can see the girls group at the top. And this group of boys, I'll just talk about. Um, they 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 did them, they, they did amazing things from a year seven all the way up until uh, year thirteen. They were taking part in Vex Robotics, and they went on to become national champions. And we um, and again, there was about three hundred fifty teams in the national finals at the time. It was it was quite a big thing. And then we end up going to America and the bottom corner, as you can see here, we, it was a 20,000 seat stadium with TV cameras and everything with, you know what the Americans are like when they go big, they go big. And um, uh, yeah, it was, it was an amazing event. And uh, we, we reached the semifinals of the world championships. It just went, it went, it went absolutely mad, like in terms of what robotics can take you and uh, uh, starting from a, a small STEM club, which we can barely afford to have a, a cupboard to going international and representing your country. And it was, it was also the impact it had on these students. And those three boys, uh, sorry, those four boys, um, two of them went on to Cambridge and they initially were interested in a whole different side in terms of career wise. You know, it were two of them gone into engineering, the other one's gone into computer science and the other one's gone into um, uh, physics. All, at degree level and they if you ask them what are their experiences why have they got to that stage they will turn around and say robotics and what they did in a club with mr ben did after school for hours and end took them to that point uh, the girls in the top corner a very similar journey they saw the boys and they said we can do we can do better we can do as good and they did they <laughs> they end up winning competitions and going and representing the uk they were the first actually all girls team to represent the uk at an international competition in the states which at, at the time was 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 amazing they were called sterling dames as well so they they try to use the british approach but yeah so it 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 was it was an amazing experience and it wasn't just about them uh, it, it, you know, a lot of the time, a lot of people kept saying to me, oh, Mr. Benzard, you did amazing, teaching them all these skills and teach them how to build. And I promise you that robot you can see in front of you, there's two robots, the, the boys are working on it, the girls are explaining. I was, my input was less than 10%. Because what you do is you, you show them the skills, you allow them to develop their understanding, and they just take it. And they take it beyond your 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 skill set which that's the aim i always say it to them they start telling me about this and that and i'm like yeah sounds brilliant what do you need me to do and then what i end up becoming was a facilitator and that club the, the best thing about that club is where I, that's where i did all my marking and that's where i did all my planning because eventually when you get to that point where, you, where the, the group become confident and the group become well trained and well skilled they work as a team they learn to pro problem solve themselves and they they, they learn all these key skills that that, that, that sadly don't need me, but I'm still there <laughs> supporting them and where, where I can. And that group of students, they want to give back, you know, um, and a couple of years ago supported our school and we end up running a, a massive event where we had, a, I can't remember, it was up nearly 10 primary schools sending a group of robotic students. And each, each group of uh, robotic student, uh, each group of students, sorry, were given a, a Lego robot brick and pieces. They had to build a robot 
they had to program it to take part in a competition. And we ran it all in one after, you know, all in one day. With the end of it, we had like a ceremony at the end and it was an absolute amazing event. Because uh, all those kids, and it was quite interesting because a couple of years, I don't know if I told you this, Ab, a couple of years later, because those kids were like year five and year six, I wanted to find out how many of those kids took part in that competition and end up coming to the school. And the percentage was around 60%. And a lot of their, and a lot of their reasons behind it was, we loved the, the robotics and we wanted to come to the school to do it as well. And that was like so many, you know, especially brownie points with management at the time at the school was, was really good. But that was, that was my journey. And, and sadly, I've moved on to, uh, I'm now the deputy head teacher at uh, my current school. And I, I'm, 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 um, I don't have the time to be running a robotics club, but we are now embedded in the, in the curriculum. So I may not have the time to do it, but we have to teach it because it's going to be in the curriculum that we, t we, we deliver because I know the benefits of it and I understand the benefits of it. And I've been speaking to my head teacher, listened to what I was saying to him about what the skills that the kids could have, especially um, post lockdown, they need the interaction, they need to start to, you know, uh, uh, there's a lot of articles about pupils, especially in primary school, regressing. And uh, by giving them something different to think about and how to, you know, a different set of skills, this allows them to progress. So hopefully this is what the next step. So if you go to the next slide, Laura, um, this is the kind of things that you could possibly think about introducing. Um, I've wrote a little bit there about the skill, you know, in terms of creativity, teamwork, leadership, problem solving. Those are the, th those are the elements I would say all day in terms of what your students will get out of this. And I always say, especially someone who's nervous, who's not too sure about introducing a club like this, start small. Don't try and start a club for, you know, you put it out to the whole of year seven and you get 30 kids to turn up. You're just setting yourself up to fail. I would pick a group of five, six kids. Choose, hand pick those kids if you want to. Work with those kids and then slowly develop that club or group in, you know, competing. Yes, you can run it as a STEM club, but I always think being competitive and competing somewhere always adds a little edge to it. It makes it more interesting, more engaged. Well, what I would recommend, the VEX Robotics, they got VEX IQ. When I started, VEX, VEX IQ has only recently been introduced. It's for key stage three. So it's really for year, year seven, year eight, year nine. Um, when I started, there was no such thing as VEX IQ, but I know uh, I've, I've brought some VEX IQ robots for my school currently, and we're introducing it. And it's, again, we've started to build that uh, real interest for it, which is a, it's a good platform to start from. Uh, VEX V5 is, um, when your VEX IQ works out, you'll have students that are ready for VEX V5. So don't even go near it until you're ready for that one. And those kids will start, they'll, they'll run it for you. Um, and there's a lot of positives there. And the last one is the, the Lego, um, the, the, yeah, the fir Lego first Lego League Mindstormers, which uh, you can see a picture there on the bottom left. I would recommend all day because all kids love Lego. They know Lego um, and they buy into it. But the Lego, for, the first Lego League brings a different element to it. It brings all those skills in terms of being creative, teamwork, leadership, and problem solving to a, a, um, a way that they are and you know how to play with. So they, they, you know, their idea of Lego is here's a set of instructions, build it, and then they have their complete model and they're like, wow, I'll finish my model. But the fact is, first Lego league, you don't get given a completed, you don't given a set of instructions, you build uh, a robot to meet a criteria. So they ask you, you need to do X, Y, and Z, Z and your students have to think strategically and work on it. I, I, I think there's Lego, first Lego league. I love first Lego league. I've been, you know, I've been connected to it for over 10 years for year seven, for year eight. It's, it's perfect for them because it gets them start thinking about the, the robotic side of things. And then you can take them onto VEX maybe as, a, as an idea, but robotics educationally can have so many impacts. Because when you turn around and say, you know, sometimes when you turn around and say, come do engineering club, they don't understand it and they don't appreciate it. They don't think it's that sexy or, you know, enjoyable. But when you say robotics, they start going, what's that about? What, it, what's, what, you know, come along, have an interest, see, see what it's like. And you, you develop a, uh, a group of really keen uh, students who, who want to compete and who want to work, work as a team. And those, those students end up become leaders as well. So um, yeah, definitely, definitely. If, you, if, if you're considering it, those are what the areas I'll definitely think about going into. And the last slide was, I was talking to Laura and I told Laura about some kids who were just very creative at my school. 
and they they took it to the next level what what what, what, what this is 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 uh, as you know covid restrictions we can't run no traditional open evenings so we ran a open evening a, a virtual open evening and the head teacher spoke for half an hour and then a couple of people spoke for another 20 30 minutes and it was so um how can i say bland and i said it to the head teacher i was honest with him i was like if i was a year five a year six student i would not enjoy that at all because it was not engaging so I went away, I spoke to some of my year nine, I spoke to my year nine group and I was like, what could we do guys, something different? I didn't want to do the video around the school because that's quite, you know, simple. We can share a video around the school and you can walk around. We decided to create a Minecraft version of the school. So a world in Minecraft. So I got a uh, group of students, they built it in a day and a half, which I couldn't believe it was so quick. Um, and they recreated the school. And then we created a video of the school and then um, we can share the world with all our year five, year six students and the year six students, year five students. A lot of them have Mindstorm. If you speak to many of them, they love Mindstorm and they end up going into the world and um, walking around the school. And that's the best way for them to see what the school was like. And the feedback's been really positive. Um, we even got retweeted and a message from Minecraft themselves because they think it was a great idea. Um, but yeah, it's another example of being creative. And if your school has Office 365, every student gets a, edu a free educational version of Minecraft. So that's something else you could think about introducing uh, because Minecraft has a lot of actually very engineering, very science, science, scientific things that you can include um, into it in terms of they have to think and plan out a lot of different, um, and they have to be very creative as well. So um, it's another example of something to introduce or think about uh, with your students in the future. All right. I'll be taking questions at the end if you if you got any. Thank you. Thank you, Sabi. And I think that's just such an incredible, the Minecraft um, open evening is such an incredible idea. And I'm definitely going to encourage the Royal Academy of Engineering to invite you and your students to the Academy to their celebration event, because I just think everyone needs to know about that. That's such a, an innovation in this time. Um, so um, this is my story. So I'm going to tell you um, about two STEM projects that I set up. Um, so the first actually started in 2016 and I started um, planning for this session by going back through my Twitter feed because I feel like it's my personal diary, my account of the things that I'm proud of. Um, and then I realised that there's quite a few things on there as I was reflecting on that time and thinking <laughs> there's a few, a few bits that I've missed out there that I probably didn't put on Twitter, like when the tank went green. So I'll, I'll talk about, I'll be honest about all of that part of the journey. Um, so I was at St Edmunds um, Catholic School and we had a, a network of um, STEM professionals that would come to our school once a term and we'd meet and we'd talk about how we can uh, develop um, activities in the school, STEM activities. Um, and one of the people was a chief engineer at BA Systems. And he said to me, Laura, I really enjoy coming in for design and make day and doing the judging. I really enjoy coming along to, you know, be a judge at various other things and support your gift and talented day where you do this, this and this. And he said, but actually, it's not terribly sustainable. And I don't feel like the students get the most out of their opportunity to liaise with and have exposure to professionals from industry. And I said, David, I completely agree. And I said, if I could, I'd have you in my lessons and then be like, by the way, you know, Dave, tell me about what you do day to day as an engineer. Um, but obviously we can't do that. And he said, well, let's do a project where we that where that is our outcome, where we are trying to make a sustainable model where children have long term, really effective exposure to STEM professionals. So um, as a big project manager, I mean, literally his projects are insanely big. Um, he sat down and we planned out a Gantt chart. We had a, a budget planned out and um, a, a lot of spreadsheets. And you know, um, I put in there, it's a huge journey. We, were, we learned lots of diverse areas of expertise along the way. I'm not just talking about the students. As a young middle leader, I learned so much from that experience of working closely with people from industry and seeing their processes and how they plan things out. And so that planning stage at the beginning was quite intensive. Um, we launched the project. Um, so this is a, a, a different model. We launched it to the whole of Key Stage 3. Uh, I went into assemblies and said, guys, there's something really big happening. It's your opportunity to be part of a project where we plan to breed rare fish 
and that got quite a few people's interest. Um, I did um, applications, so I did letter applications. I said to be part of the club, the only thing you need to do is write a letter of application. And I had all these students, you know, coming to me at break time and lunch. How do I do a letter of application? And there's other teachers helping them write their application. What I didn't mention was it wasn't a selective process. <laughs> I just wanted some commitment. I just wanted them to tell me why they were interested. I wanted some anecdotal like words of why they were interested in being involved. And it just felt like a bit more commitment than show up and then you can leave if you don't fancy it. So, um, so we had, uh, I think we had over 30 applications. Um, but we got we got a good core of sort of 20 students who showed up regularly every single week. Uh, we were a long time in the planning before we even got a fish tank. So we had 14 engineers that worked with us. Um, all of them were from a variety of different backgrounds. So um, David really wanted that. He, he said it's really important that we expose um, engineers who have come down lots of different routes so that students can see that engineering isn't just something you have to go to university to do. You know, there's um, the variety of different levels of apprenticeship that you can come down. So um, every week, uh, so the first week, sorry, the first week, all 14 engineers came along, sat in my lab. We did a speed networking event so that students could kind of get to know them, ask them about their job roles, um, find out what they were doing in the next couple of weeks. And then we planned a program and every week the students would, um, the, the engineers would email me a presentation and in, in the early days I gave them quite a lot of support of making activities um, appro appropriate for the students and helping them manage activities like I'd say perhaps if you demonstrate that first and show them what you mean and then let them go and do it because of course these are professionals they're not teachers you know I studied at university for a long time to become a teacher so it was my responsibility to support them to be good facilitators for the sessions. So um, in the early days, I'd get the presentation a week in advance and the activities, and then we'd adapt to them and, and, and make them really, really effective. Uh, we did all kinds of things. This was from one of the student videos, Sea Monkeys and Mind Control. Um, all we did there was we took brine shrimp from a local uh, pet shop and we um, put them in different containers. We didn't do anything cruel to them, put them in different containers and varied the amount of light that was exposed to them and counted um, how many were on each side so we could look at their response to light. Um, and actually the kids loved that. And I let them take the brine shrimp home afterwards as pets and younger siblings love that. It's a really, really cheap and effective way. And I don't think I actually paid for the brine shrimp. Um, that pet shop later on, it turned out this uh, little lad here, I'm pointing as if you can see, uh, the little lad with ginger hair just here, his grandfather owned the pet shop. So after I got the brine shrimp from the pet shop, he said, hey, Laura, I breed fish. Why don't you come down and bring all your students down and you can um, have a little tour of my, you can see the back scenes where we, we breed all the fish in the, in the pet shop. And I was like, incredible. So that was another session week. We, uh, it was just down the road from the school. We all we had to do a full risk assessment still. Uh, marched all the students, uh, 20 or so of them into this tiny little fish shop. And this uh, guy gave uh, an extensive talk on how to breed fish. Uh, we did all kinds of other experiments, like uh, we looked at the biochemistry behind water, we did some chemical testing of water in small tanks, we set up tanks to see how algae would form and how quickly it would form. Uh, we looked at the structure and the engineering and the calculations of the pressure um, and looked at the design of the tank, uh, like every intricate little detail. And the students also researched the different types of fish that we might breed, what conditions they would need, how we would breed them, what nursery materials that we'd need. We had it all costed out. I think it cost about £3,000 for all of the equipment, which BA Systems were going to pay for it all. It was going to be amazing. We'd spent good knows how many months in the preparation, doing all of the experimenting to work out and make decisions as a team. And then... Um, BAE invested in a <laughs> different educational project and the funding was all gone and it, I did I did fall flat a little bit I was like but you said you were going to give us some money and I've got 20 kids who literally have been promised something and they're not going to get it and that was a that was a 
a, a little bump in the road. Um, but it wasn't a problem because we did some fundraising. Uh, we scaled back. So we were going to build the tank ourselves and buy materials and, and literally use the engineers to like help us assemble one. And in the end, we compromised for buy, to, to buy a tank. And we went for a lot smaller tank. And we were going to just do one tank initially. So I think we reduced the, cap, the cost down to less than a thousand pounds. So that was one of the bumps in the road. Um, we got to visit an aquarium. So this was from uh, a trip. We've got a late night at Blue Reef, completely free. It's funny because when big, big companies like BA Systems pop along to the aquarium and tell them we've got a big project going on, they were like, yeah, come down for free. We'll close the um, aquarium for an evening and all the students can come and see what we do here, which was amazing. Uh, we got to go in the back and see the um, uh, see all the quarantine zones for the fish that had just come in. We saw all the nurseries for the fish that were um, being bred. And we even had um, a short mini lecture about the nitrogen cycle. Now, if you ever talk the nitrogen cycle, it's probably a, a slightly dry topic of science, but there was literally years seven, eight and nine on the edge of their seats asking questions and asking how it was going to affect the chemistry of the water and asking how it was going to impact the fish. And, you know, from there, those students have got a solid, <laughs> had a very solid understanding of real life applications of the nitrogen cycle ready for GCSE. Um, so, yeah, one morning I came down, uh, the fish tank had gone completely green. The librarian said to me, Laura, come downstairs immediately. Look what's happened to the fish tank. Because um, we put the fish tank in the library, you see, so that it would have uh, basic, basically greater exposure so that lots of people could go and see there. And I thought if I had it in my lab, then, you know, people wouldn't be able to come in and out during my lessons. So it just made sense to put it in the library. The librarian did not love that and was furious when there was an unsightly green tank in her room. I was in a mad panic. What's happened to my fish tank? I don't have the skills or expertise to be able to resolve this quickly. And then I phoned David and then I was reminded, actually, this isn't my project. Project. this is the student's project and actually this isn't my problem to solve this is the student's problem to solve so the engineers came down and we came up with 20 different reasons that it could have happened we didn't actually get to the bottom of it but actually the processes of, of exploring those issues and problem solving were the, the important it was the journey right not the not the outcome um, so we did it just I'm going to be honest with you we emptied the tank and started again <laughs> started again with our biochemistry kits we were a double double triple quadruple check every chemical that went in and every uh, chemical test that we carried out. Um, this was the um, vacuum, the, the, it, was, it was essentially a vacuum cleaner for the, um, for the fish tank, which the students literally created a rotor of who got to clean the tank each week, because obviously that's the coolest job. <laughs> Um, and, you know, one of my, my, my head of department at the time said to me, Laura, a STEM project is only as good as its sustainability after you've left. And I am really proud to say that St. Edmunds still do have their fish tank. They still do have a project around it and they do still do have students who run this project. Um, I've been gone for four years, so none of them who I've taught. I think there's been two teachers who have run it since me, but I'm really proud that that is still going. And that really was a testament to it was a really effective project, but run by some incredible children. Um, <laughs> I put in there, let's talk about attendance, Lewis. Lewis was a student who um, I think was hugely impacted by this project. Absolutely great student. Um, very, very strong leadership skills. However, I would say his approach sometimes was questionable. And he created, um, so it got to the point where, like Sabi said, I just take some marking and I go and sit at the back of the session because the engineers led it, facilitated it, the students were in charge, they made all of the decisions. I didn't, I was literally just there so they could be in the room. And, um, and Lewis had created a spreadsheet and was calculating people's percentage attendance to the sessions because we were doing crest awards and you have to do so many hours. And as he'd done his gold, his gold crest award uh, from the work that he'd done on this, he didn't think it was fair that students should be able to do less hours and get the same qualification as he did. So he was pulling them aside and having a little chat. Why weren't you at the session last week? <laughs> I had to have a chat with Lewis. I'd say, listen mate, I am very impressed with your leadership skills. You are brilliant and really effective at monitoring. However, let's be a little bit kinder. Let's be a bit forgiving. There might be reasons that people can't stay for every single session. And that was a really valuable learning experience for him as well. Um, I popped in a timeline of other things that we did while I was at that school. 
So we had DSDL from the Ministry of Defence um, who came down and did a radioactive workshop with the year 10s when they were learning that section of physics. And they brought down all the handheld Geiger counters. They talked about, you know, Portsmouth ourselves being very, very high risk of, of a potential um, a, a potential disaster and how they have iodine tablets on hand in case and it was a really really engaging process and that brought more people in even though it's completely separate but more people that came and joined the fish tank project and um, why am I including that bit is because actually this isn't just a, a one string bow when you take a steam approach, approach in school it might start as one small project but then you start agreeing to other things and actually you know you start bombarding the curriculum with all these additional context-based learning opportunities which engages more and more students and back to what we were saying at the very beginning of this session that's what's going to address the skill shortage isn't it that's what is going to engage these young people I'm aware that we're running close to time but um, I started at a new school so um, I started at Castleview Academy in the north of Portsmouth. Um, I didn't have time to set up a STEM club um, but I did anyway because I love it and basically um, last June um, I was approached by the Wildlife Hampshire and uh, Wildlife Trust and they were like we've got this brilliant project going on about marine champions and about reducing plastics and you know saving the environment around the Solent and I was like oh I love it and I put it to my team and said anyone fancy leading this project and everyone was like we're really busy Laura and we're trying to do this and we're trying to do that and I was like okay and I thought do you know what like I, I know it's extra time but I love it I really enjoy this so I'm, I'm gonna do it I'm gonna do it so um we started um I put out an offer I went into assemblies again and just said hey guys anyone fancy coming and joining a marine committee we're gonna save the solent we're gonna reduce plastics in the ocean um it's also true to my heart I did marine biology at university I felt like this is getting back to my roots um and we had a great uptake of students again i think i had between 14 and 20 students um that kind of came and go and the very first core group were absolutely amazing so we appointed you know we appointed a proper full committee as per the project so we had like a secretary we did have a we had a campaigns officer we had a treasurer the lot uh, we met with Emily from the Wildlife Trust. She gave them a box of samples. There was mermaid purses in there. There was sponges. There were shells. There was actual um, things tactile that they could touch that had been found on the beach down the road from them, which was incredible. And although I live, um, although I work in in Pools Grove, which is at the north of the city, and the sea is at the end of, I can see it from my classroom. It's at the end of the field. A lot of the students, because that's not like a shoreline you can go on very easily, a lot of students don't spend a lot of time on the beach and it really re-engaged them with the nature around them. It was beautiful. So for the first for the first half term, I wrote a programme. I did that. I did have to input some of my own time uh, writing this programme of things that we do each week. And we had talks from Emily. She came and did an incredible talk about seagrasses. Did you know that seagrasses remove more carbon dioxide from the atmosphere per year than the entire rainforest? like incredible so we had sessions like that the children uh, started building campaigns around that by October 2019 there was a full student takeover um I literally took a back seat then I was at the back of my classroom doing my marking I was also at the back of the classroom sat down because I was fairly heavily pregnant um and the students were like miss get off your feet sit down we're running this we're in control um they were they created a plastics campaign they applied for things in my name which i would given them permission to a huge sack arrived in school uh, these um surfers against sewage uh, plastic rubbin, rubbish bags and i said oh guys i'm really proud of you but i don't think we can take the whole whole school to the beach to do the beach clean they said no miss the beach is at the end of our school field do you realize how much plastics are on our school field that probably end up in the Solons. We don't even need to go to the beach miss to do a beach clean. We can start with our school first. And that's what they did. In November, they started a year seven competition. And these sacks were literally the size of me, bigger than, taller than me and wider than me. And each year seven tutor group didn't just fill one sack, that was their, their aim. They filled like two, three. The whole of our school hall was filled with these humongous sacks of plastic bottles. And I was thinking, I'm going to go off on maternity leave soon and what am I going to do with all these plastic bottles as the caretaker is going to me Laura what are you doing with all that rubbish in the school hall so um 
the Emily came down. We had the Marine Celebration event at our school. So there were five other schools participating in this project, which is lottery funded. And um, Emily said, I'd love your school to host it because they've by far done the most um, in terms of campaigning and most active uh, work around plastics in the ocean. So we hosted and she invited a local artist. And this is uh, Courtney here in one of the chairs that was created by the local artist. And she does art installations that use plastic from the beach, so from beach cleans and she creates like masterpieces. Um, so we gave her all, I think it was like maybe 12 sacks of rubbish. And she took all of that, all plastics, bottle, plastic bottles, crisp packets. My head teacher said the school field's never been so clean. He saw year sevens crawling into the bushes and finding like, you know, five year old packets of crisps and put it so they could fill it in their bag. Incredible, like lovely impacts on all, 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 all places. In the marine event, um, celebration event, the students had like a whole circus of activities. So they got an opportunity to tell the other schools what they've been doing and they were so proud. And my school are totally the underdog of the city. You know, previously we've been the guys with the bad rep with the poor results and they always feel really insecure around other schools. And do you know what? Like that event, they were so proud. Oh, it's gonna make me ch choked up. They were like, miss, I'm dead proud. Our committee's clearly the best, isn't it? And although I'm not normally like, <laughs> yeah you're the best i was like no guys you really have done incredible work and the other schools are looking at you in awe you know and some of those schools were private schools um it was just lovely uh, we had a speaker who was on blue planet like the actual blue planet series and he brought uh, these little cups the polystyrene cups and one had obviously been taken um diving at great depths um and so was and James here explained the entire physics to his table behind why the cup was reduced in size. It was amazing. They had a dolphin skeleton, which the kids could touch. Incredible. Um, and it is a student led committee. I went off in maternity in February and I was not worried. My head teacher said, who's going to take on your marine committee? And I said, well, there's another teacher who will oversee and give them a room and a space. But actually, you know, they didn't need a teacher because they lead the committee and I have very little to do with it. They were writing to MPs as I left and challenging them on the marine conservation zones, which, you know, is beyond most adults. Um, this was their Twitter. Um, and do you know what, when I go back after um, maternity leave, I'm so excited. Whatever state our marine committee is in, due to COVID obviously, um, there will still be some students there interested. And I know that we'll be doing even bigger and better things um, next year when things are hopefully a little bit more normal. And so I'm conscious that I do want to get to question time. Um, I have, I've got given an a set of slides to circulate with all of the information, but I think when you're constructing your STEM opportunities, this is my cauldron of things that you should you should think about. Think about context. Think about involving experts. I think that exposure, even if the experts aren't like telling you stuff necessarily, the exposure to people who do that in their real life is brilliant. Have problems, but don't solve them. Let the students solve them. And really, really important student-led learning the best test of any stem provision is if you can sit at the back and do your marking and they tell you to keep your nose out then you've done the best job um i've put a couple of places that you can that you can go to uh, mike and i are delivering a session around um around designing a curriculum with a steam approach which um, me and him have been developing resources for the japanese government so i feel like we're in a good place to to um be able to support you with that. Um, the Royal Academy of Engineering have got a whole host of resources. So if you want something off the shelf that you can just literally take into your school and embed, then that's a really good place to go. I've put a couple of links for Sabi's robotics work. Um, and then I would really encourage you to go towards um, this further reading. So I'm gonna ask for I've spoken lots. I'm gonna take any questions, but I'm gonna, first of all, has anyone got any questions for Sabi? So you don't have to continue to listen to my voice. Yeah, Maria. Hi, thanks, Laura and Sabi. That was absolutely incredible. I mean, I was just blown away with the amount of, you know, content that you had there. I I'm teaching Key Stage 2, so I would be really interested in how the Lego First League, um, well, anything like that. And I know that you put in the chat that we could, you know, it can be adapted for Key Stage 2, but I teach Year 5, and I think they're at that age where they they just love it. Last year before COVID, I was involved with the Scottish... Um, Enterprise Academy. So our children in my class won the Dragon's Den initiative. They won £150 to make little bags of happiness and they were um, saving money for the uh, climate coalition. So I was not needed at all. 
So I'm really interested in what I can do to give something to the children and then step back because they don't need me. So how could I encourage, you know, Key Stage 2 and, you know, my fellow um, colleagues to do that? Um, hi, Maria. Um, I can hear a, a very good example of this was uh, one thing that we started to do. We started to host Lego robotics competitions because we were involved for so long. And I come across not just one, but about three or four or five schools, year fives and year sixes. So what the teacher would do is they would, you know, like yourself, a year five class or a year six class, they would have about five or six robots. So you can buy these kits and um, the class will be split into how many groups of fours or fives and each person will have a role in the group. And the teacher would say, we literally spend an hour a week or an afternoon a week uh, to work on this project. And at the end of it was uh, the team who then they would do an in-class competition and the team that wins the in-class competition would then compete in a, in a national competition. And there's a whole range that you could sign up to and choose from. The way first Lego League works is you initially buy the kit and which is the Lego Mindstormers kit and you pay for one off fee and you get the robot and you get lots of bits with it and it gives you designs that you can create initially. If you want to take part in the Lego Robotics, um, the first Lego League, you sign up for it and they send you a competition mat and competition parts to it. So you would set up the mat and uh, the mat has a range of different challenges on there. And the students should have built their robot to tackle the different challenges in a group. And they would then have, you know, your group now has 10 minutes and they can test their programming. And it ticks so many different skills from their computing skills to their uh, engineering skills to their kind of thinking skills problem solving skills team working skills and it's one afternoon a week and this school and that's so I, I thought it was just one odd school but it was so many different schools doing it especially at primary school level and then by the end of that term they, they end up having a mini competition and that school ends up going you know that group end up going away and competing at a local competition and that was part of the journey for them and then getting to the local competition was like they're one they're their school champions so they're going to go now to the local competition whatever happens happens and they end up learning from that as well so no no definitely 100 percent. it sounds like ready made for your your little group of absolutely absolutely they're, they're, they sound like a group of winners as well <laughs> oh they are absolute geniuses um and it's from a very um it's a very poor demographic area in southeast london so they just they want to do as much as they can um, and I'd be interested in the research. What happens then? Is there a greater uptake for STEM subjects in secondary school because of anything that's happened lower down in primary school? Um, like I said, from, from the project that we ran with um, Anne, it was just for primary school year fives and sixes. And the group of students, I'm, I'm talking nearly 10 schools, and they sent us about five kids per school. And each group was mixed gender. And that, th those students then applied to go to secondary school and a massive chunk of them wanted to come to our school based on the mm. fact that they got to do robotics and they want to carry on the robotics. Mm. And, you know, that's like gold dust. And then you suddenly got all these kids who are coming to our school because of robotics. And what robotics is, I said to them, it's computer, I'm a computer science teacher. I don't, I don't, I'm not an engineer at all, honestly. And um, they want to come to the school because of engineering, because of robotics, because of science. And suddenly they have an interest in, in STEM subjects. And like I said, you know, the end goal for those students, those boys that I showed you, because I, I saw them all the way through to year 13, is they went on to actually not just do A-levels and GCSEs with STEM subjects, but they also end up going to degrees. And they, they're, they're going to be careers to, like Laura said in her early presentation, where there's a shortage. Mm. Uh, so th th there's a clear linear of, of if, you, if, you capture their, if you capture that audience really early on, they would definitely be at the, the you know, and I feel, and I, and I honestly feel like Mindstormers, I mean, uh, Minecraft can do that as well. So I'm, I'm looking at how I can introduce that as well now. Lovely. I, I've, uh, I did a project a few years ago as a consultant with Paul Hamlin Foundation. There might be some money there because they'd be interested in running research projects to see how, you know, something you do early on in primary school carry on. But thank you, Sabi. That's really great. Thank you. Thank you.
I think as well, Maria, like, so I run a STEM network and, um, I, and it's primarily supposed to be the funding is for Key Stage 3. So the Royal Academy are like, make sure you've got plenty of secondary schools there and our remit is for Key Stage 3. But I also run, because I was like, well, Scott, I think we need to start earlier than that. I think Key Stage 2 is really important. And actually, I have children from, so my school is in a really, really deprived community and we've got five feeder schools and they have very, very little. And, you know, they're always saying, Laura, can we come up to your labs and do, because we've got a brand new building building amazing labs Laura please can we come up to your lab and do some science and they always say to me and can we set stuff on fire and do stuff like that and I'm like yeah 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 come up and actually um you know the the ability and the things that I've done the scientific skills which are really really complex that I've done with year fives are literally you know I, I just think I always think I always say to my STEM network so I run a primary network as well because I say Scott no it's really important and to be honest my primary teachers are a little bit more reliable in terms of showing up and um I said, no, it's really important that we keep this primary network because actually, you know, they really utilise the resources as well and they consistently come. And actually, whenever the primary network comes to my meetings, I say, scratch out Key Stage 3 because everything here can be used for your Key Stage 2 students because I've seen them. I've had them in my school. I know they're capable of doing these activities. And especially when it comes to a lot of the computing and programming activities, because the Royal Academy have some work around crumbles, around micro bits, and, um, and that is not my background. And I delivered a session around using crumbles. And I said to the primary teachers, if I can do it, your students can 100% do it. <laughs> I, man I managed to program a crumble to make a sequence of rainbow LEDs light up on it. It's called a sparkle stick. And um, I was so proud of myself. But Scott did say to me at the Royal Academy, yeah, 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 year fives and sixes do stuff like that all the time. And I'm like, oh. <laughs> Have you got any other questions? Just while we wait a minute, I put I put some of these on the end. Oh, sorry, Anne, go on. I just wanted to say that um, Isita has asked um, for how she could adapt the um, things that you've talked about to the curriculum in Sierra Leone. So Laura, I've offered you for a conversation um, when she's got some sound, if you don't mind. I think what um, Lucy suggested is we're going to send her the video so she'll be able to watch it. And then um, I hope I can include you, Sabi, as well, if she's got any questions um, yeah. about robotics. Maybe we could email you um, and, and come back to her. And I just wanted to um, tell everybody here that Sabi and Laura have been really fantastic with the international work in supporting education in other places so um, they both gave us lots of resources um, Sabi's robotic kits that he used um, as part of the com competition when they um, won the competition they got some money for new robotics kits um, they packaged up the old ones and we sent them to Haiti and also Laura was very good at getting us some uh, science kits from the Royal Academy of Engineering and I took them in my suitcase to Haiti as well and um, the teachers love them I mean I'm not a, a teacher at all and I don't know much about science but I went down to Laura's school and she showed me how some of the things were the little light things and the batteries how you put them together and we and you know them heating globes that you hold in your hand and we had such fun. We had a whole day um, with the teachers in Haiti. And I just want to thank you both for that because it's fantastic to be sharing all of this globally. Definitely. And I think if one thing can come from this global pandemic is that we can we can work a bit more internationally joining up some of those dots, right? Like I think, you know, what why on earth would we keep it a secret when we've got brilliant curriculum ideas and STEM opportunities would be silly to keep it quiet and keep it here. I want everyone in the world to know that there's exciting things you can do to engage children. Thank you. Oh, brilliant. Um, just finally, I added this on, you can have a look later, but this is, I just wanted to signpost some really cool things that you could like introduce to children. So um, there's a group at UCL called Metabolite and they use light to literally just shine it into a baby's head and they use really, really simple um, engineering devices 
um, in fact, just digital cameras that will detect the light that's reflected out from the baby's brain. And it gives them a really good indicator. It's completely non-intrusive and gives an indicator of the oxygen levels in the baby's blood in the brain to be able to earlier determine whether or not they're at risk of cerebral palsy if there's been birth complications incredible research and like really cool scientists and stem back stem and steam background behind there and there's some resources for the royal academy that address that as well and um, the mathematics of cancer like using uh computer modeling to see how tumors have like really complex big blood vessels that are really messy and um, they can look at the different drug pathways and how they can treat tumors in cancer um, and then also the work I've been doing recently with Johan, there's some really cool research out there. Uh, this this uh, professor who's doing some research about biohybrid robots that basically the skin can heal um, and you can create a robot um, with human, with not human tissue, with living tissue, synthetic living tissue. Um, and then he likes to point out at the end of the session that actually the robots, you can have relatively low waste because you can eat the synthetic meat at the end. I think kids would like that. So there's some context if you wanted to get your creative juices flowing. Um, any more questions before we end? No, not for me. Thank you both so much. It's been really, really special. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.